Hello and welcome to Five Things. I'm USA Today health reporter Karen Weintraub. The first successful transplant surgery was done in 1954 with a kidney transplanted from one identical twin into another. Since then, U.S. surgeons have completed over a million transplant operations. Still about 100,000 Americans sit on a waiting list for an organ transplant, and many more never qualify for a list at all. The problem is one of basic supply and demand. Dr. Robert Montgomery, director of the Transplant Institute at NYU Langone Health, is hoping to change that equation to give more people a chance at a longer, healthier life. Dr. Montgomery, thank you for joining me. And thank you, Karen. It's nice to be here. Maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about 57-year-old Maurice Miller, whom everyone calls Mo. Mo's a gentleman who developed a really uh, terrible tumor, brain tumor, um, that has a very high mortality rate. And he presented actually at a hospital, didn't know that he had a brain tumor um, after a seizure, and then he passed out and was found down. And they tried to biopsy the tumor and it bled, and he bled inside his head and then became brain dead. Um, and, And that's when we found out about him because he had you know, indicated that he wanted to donate his um, organs when he died. But because he had this particular type of very aggressive brain tumor, um, he wasn't a candidate for organ donation. So the folks who, um, you know, from our organ procurement organization who were uh, working with his family um, told them about this other option where he could uh, donate his entire body um, for the purposes of uh, a research study. Mo's been in this ICU room for about two months that had special meaning for you and not just because it had a beautiful view of the East River. Can you explain a little bit about what that room means to you, meant to you? The special significance that the room has is that's where I spent um, over a month waiting for a heart transplant five years ago, almost exactly five years, and then recovering from that transplant. Um, And that's where he spent um, two months um, with a pig kidney um, inside his body doing everything that was um, required of it uh, to filter out the toxins in his blood and do all the other things that a kidney does. Why did Mo or his sister agree to let him participate in this research? Mo's sister, Mary, um, who was very close to him, really felt that this was something that he would want. Um, He was a very kind hearted person, very giving, cared about other people. Um, And so she thought this was in perfect alignment with the person that he was. And talk to us a little bit about, about the surgery, the process itself. What did you do? We set up the transplant just like we would any other um, transplant between two humans. So um, we sent a team um, down to Virginia where um, the pig farm is on a jet and they procured um, the uh, pig's kidney and flew back. And at the same time, I started the uh, recipient operation on Mo. And we did the kidney transplant just like we would a regular transplant, except for one thing, we removed his own kidney, so his native kidneys, so that all the urine and you know all the work that a kidney has to do would need to be done by the gene edited pig kidney so we would be able to separate that out and really test um, the kidney and know exactly what um, it was doing and how well it was performing can you tell us a little bit about about the pig who gave its life for for this procedure the pig is raised in a um a, a very clean environment um and is monitored. We do surveillance for about 35 different pathogens, viruses, bacteria, parasites. And so we know exactly, um, you know, what the state of that pig's health is um, and exactly, you know, what it's been exposed to. It has a lot of activities that and toys and things like that. And then at the time that we remove the uh, kidney, it's given a a general anesthetic, so uh, it doesn't have any pain. Um, And then given a lethal injection after the the kidneys um, are removed. You talked about the gene editing. What what genes are edited in this pig? So for this particular pig, 
Um, it's actually a, a, a pig uh, line. So there's a herd of pigs. They're called gal safe pigs. And they've had one gene knockout. And um, that gene is um, responsible for creating a carbohydrate that coats all of the cells um, of the pig. And that carbohydrate, um, the enzyme that makes that has actually been lost during evolution from pig to human. So humans don't express that carbohydrate, but that carbohydrate is shared by bacteria. So we make um, a very strong immune response to that carbohydrate in order to keep bacteria inside our gut so the purpose of this research was to to see if the kidney could function, the pig kidney could function in the person without triggering an immune response over this time period? It wasn't rejected and had a good function, but that's about all we could really answer from a three-day study. For this longer study, um, which in the end, we reapproached the family and our um, institutional review board, we got permission to extend it to two months. And we were able to answer some important questions. Number one, um, what about what's called the adaptive immune response? So the adaptive immune response is we have um, an a, um, apparatus, you know, in our immune system um, that allows us to engage a novel, um, you know, foreign material, whether it's a virus or foreign tissue. Um, and develop a well choreographed, very strong immune response. But it takes time. It takes somewhere between 10 to 14 days to really develop that response so that you can essentially, you know, slay the invader and get rid of um, that, that foreign material that's in your body. So the reason why we really wanted to go up to at least a month is so that we could see that adaptive immune response fully develop. Um, and then the second thing we were really looking at is, does the um, pig kidney take up all of the regular functions of the kidney aside from just making urine and clearing toxins? And did it work? Well, it functioned great. So it functioned even better than a human kidney because actually pig kidneys have twice as much function as a human kidney. You know, the kidney was just as good, maybe even a little better at the end of the study, um, at the end of the two months. So the function was great. He did have a mild rejection, which was actually good because um, we could not only study it and begin to understand what rejection looks like um, between a human and a, and a pig organ, but we could also treat it and use our therapeutics to try to reverse it. And so he had a mild rejection and it was fully reversible. And that was really important information as well. And what do next steps look like? What, what, what do you do next in this process? Those initial studies that we did gave us a lot of information. Um, but this study, um, I think really, you know, looking at this kidney, after 61 days and seeing how well it was functioning, there wasn't any protein in the urine and there wasn't any ongoing rejection. It really looked very pristine um, and was doing essentially all the things that a human kidney would do. I think this is a big jump forward. And I think the FDA, um, once they've had an opportunity to review all the data, and we're still analyzing it, I think is going to um, really take the the work in humans and the human decedent model very seriously, and it should accelerate us towards um, clinical trials. So I think you're going to start to see some living humans transplanted very soon. Um, and a lot of it is going to be the result of this last study that we've just done. And how do you hope this research ultimately changes the world of transplants? The single uh, most significant unmet need in transplantation is organ supply. And we can't even begin to estimate how big that problem is because so many people die even before um, they're counted, you know, on a transplant list. Only, you know, the people that we think have the best chance 
of survival ever even make it to a, uh, a transplant list. So there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of lives that are lost. I mean, myself, I had seven cardiac arrests where I had to be um, resuscitated. Some, some of those which required, you know, prolonged CPR that I was just very lucky to have survived before I was deemed to be sick enough to get listed for a heart transplant. And so, you know, just to give you a sense, every year there are a million people in the United States that are, are newly diagnosed with heart failure. The uh, mortality rate for heart failure over five years is 50%. Last year, we only did about 3,500, 3,600 heart transplants. So a million people with heart failure and just under 4,000 transplants. Think about that. Not even really, you know, um, dealing with the tip of the iceberg when it comes to um, organ failure in transplantation. If we had an unlimited, sustainable supply of organs that didn't require to have someone die in order for someone else to live, but we could um, basically, um, you know, whenever someone needed a transplant at the time they needed it, rather than having them wait for years um, and die, you know, on the transplant waiting list, we could transplant them with a pig organ. Uh, it would change everything. Anything else you want people to know about this kind of research and why you're so passionate about it? In the run-up to getting listed for a transplant and recovering from you know multiple cardiac arrests and then sitting in the uh, ICU waiting for an organ, not knowing whether one was going to come, um, I had a lot of time to think about this. And I'm passionate because I've lived it. I've walked in those shoes. Um, I know what our patients go through, and I, I just foresee a life that's going to be different where people don't have to die waiting for an organ. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Karen. Thanks for watching.